You mentioned this morning, or in your opening statement, the Irish Times this morning. Um, and uh, I see where Martin Dunn, the director of the service, National Ambulance Service, is quoted, um, saying that the process involved the updating emergency services systems to adapt to air court, and so on. Because Mr Dunn in 2014 wrote, at no stage has the National Ambulance Service or myself outlined that this system is the answer to all our needs in relation to rapid access to patients, etc. However, it is a mechanism that will assist and fill the void that exists at the moment. So that's at variance with the statement this morning. And I'm just wondering what has happened in the meantime and how much was spent uh, to make the air court compatible with the NAS um, um, service or vice versa? Yeah, as, I, as I understand it, the National Ambulance Service was engaged in any event of an in an upgrade of their, their, their dispatch uh, facility and information, and information systems. And uh, we've been in contact with the National Ambulance Service uh, since the, um, the um, air code uh, design was put in place, uh, discussing with them the utility of air code in relation to providing an additional mechanism uh, by which the ambulance service could identify a property. Uh, and dispatch the um, the ambulance to that location. I mean, obviously, what we're looking at here is the use of the air codes, primarily, I would imagine, in rural areas. Uh, and when you see uh, what is happening in some parts of the country in terms of the centralisation of ambulance services on a regional or sub-regional basis, it makes eminent sense to me that uh, where you have a, an identifier which can, I, can identify each and every individual property in the state and to be able to integrate that into the uh, computer-aided dispatch system that the ambulance service has, I think it adds potentially significant value to the ambulance service in their ability to respond quickly to incidents in a residence or a I accept that, but I understand that from the comment made in correspondence in 2014 that that wasn't the case. Uh, they seem to be coming to this after the event and were not included in the process uh, in developing the air court, it would seem, from what Mr Dunn is saying in 2014. That's the point I'm making. And is, is, is the National Ambulance Service bringing its systems up to speed, compatible with air code, and if so, how much did that cost? How much did, how much did the cost? Yeah, because uh, we have to add all of these costs, yeah. extra add-on costs, yeah. uh, to the uh, cost of providing air code yeah. uh, in order to establish what the real expenditure uh, level of taxpayers' yeah. money is now. So if you could come back to that maybe later on. Well, I, certainly we're, we're, we're quite happy to talk to the ambulance service and uh, determine a figure that would have been involved. But I expect that the figure is actually quite minimal. I mean, there's, there, there is... Uh, that. No, but my, my expectation would be, um, would be that it would be quite minimal. And while the, the engagement... I, I, don't, I don't have a figure. I mean, they have to buy a licence from... Uh, but, but then you don't know, to be fair. No, I don't. don't no, but I'm, 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 giving a, I'm giving a view on it. But we, yeah. we'll, we'll absolutely find out what the cost for the ambulance service is to specifically integrate air, air code. But I suppose the point I would make in relation to the use of air code by public sector bodies, um, we would expect to see public sector bodies uh, integrate air codes into their operations as part of the normal business and upgrade cycle that they have in place for their systems. And that is what we are seeing happening uh, when you look at the, um, the, the other bodies that, that, uh, that are engaged in, in, in upgrades across the public sector at the moment. And while the National Ambulance Service wouldn't have been necessarily consulted as part of the consultation processes that went on uh, as the design of the uh, uh, postcode system evolved between 2006 and when a contract was awarded in 2013. 
there were extensive consultations with both the HSE and the Department of Health uh, at various stages, including around the design of the, uh, the air code itself or the postcode itself, uh, and a view expressed by both in the latter stages of the consultation process, albeit that when you go back to 2006, as, as uh, Seamus has said, the, the view would have been uh, we should land on a, on a non-unique uh, postal address type uh, block face postcode. Certainly the view that emerged in discussion with the HSE and the Department of Health uh, and, and a range of bodies in the public and private sector that a unique postcode was the type of postcode that should be put in place. And if you, if you look at it and you, you, you take the ambulance service as an example, if you use the postal sector model, which might identify anything between 10 and uh, uh, 50 addresses as part of a block, it would absolutely be useless in rural Ireland where you're dealing with 35% uh, non-unique addresses. But well, we'll come back to you on that specific point that you've, we'll you've, talk you've raised. About it. For the benefit of, of the committee and for others who, who, who are watching this, this is a large-scale, complex, public-private ICT project. We simply had to ensure it was resourced quickly and with the right skill sets. People who had experience of stakeholder management, people who had experience of outreach, people who had experience of dealing with complex communications uh, projects, people who had experience of... Uh, project management and project management of a complex public-private uh, IT project. And people, I mean, the issue we spoke of uh, a few minutes back was in relation to the um, encoding of the public sector databases. We were talking about uh, encoding 80 million records across perhaps 20 bodies. Um, it was important that we had someone in place who had experience of operating at a senior level within, the, within or with government departments and had, had a network and capacity to try and have that job completed within a relatively short period of time. And it's a retired public servant. It is not I mean, unusual. Uh, for, oh no, we know it's not unusual it's because not unusual, we see it here week in, week but out. But there is provision for that. It, it is allowed. It is allowed under the... What's not allowed is that there would not I be know, competitive tendering. And I, and That's I, not allowed. And I'm trying to... How the individuals were selected? The uh, the two consultants. If it just called yeah. consultant A, B, or C, Consult or consultant A. What, att what attracted the departments to each one of them? What outstanding skills had they? Well, in relation to, to uh, consultant, uh, in relation to consultant B, the department had worked with consultant B on the digital switchover. Uh, and That's consultant what? Consultant B. But start at the beginning, wherever they are. Cons consultant A. Consultant A uh, was involved in the PSB encoding, and he um, would have been well recognised as someone who had very extensive uh, senior level IT experience within the public sector, and also, I think, crucially, uh, a network within. The, um, a network within the government and public sector system in terms of contacts at a high so level. So what, what was, the, what was the, the biggest project that Consultant A managed? He would have managed the public sector database encoding and working with public sector bodies in relation to uh, ironing out any particular issues that may have arisen in relation to the application of air code within their own systems. B then? Consultant B was a, what we would have termed the communications lead. He successfully managed the national digital switchover for the department. Uh, and I think if you look at the effect of the outreach campaign uh, that was undertaken in the summer of 2015, uh, and you look at the number of people who were supported through that campaign uh, and the, um, the lack of concern in relation to a project that some may have considered intrusive amongst that target group, I would have considered that the output there was quite, quite okay. extraordinary, in fact. Uh, C? Consultant C. Was he working for the Department of Communications, Energy and Natural Resources because you said he was in the digital switchover? No, he wasn't an employee of the department, no. But he was a retired civil servant? He was a retired civil servant. From which department? Or? He was re retired, sorry, he was a retired public servant from okay. ESB. 
That's uh, A. Yeah. That's B, I must That's B. Sorry, A is the individual who dealt with the public sector body and coding. B is the individual who dealt with the, the communications aspects of... Yeah, but what department? What department? Consultant A was... E. No, no. Consultant, no, consultant B, B was, was with the ESB. No, you said... No. You said you said, you said a while ago to me that Consultant A was ESB. No. Consultant Sorry. B, you said, was the digital switchover. Consultant A, you said, was the ESB. He was a senior level IT experience and managed the public sector. Oh, sorry, I place. beg your pardon. Consultant A is ESB. Yeah. And ESB and so, Consultant so A did the... So he's uh, a retired ESB. He's retired consultant ESB. Consultant B, then. And he did the... Uh, he was a communications lead. Yeah. Consultant B was retired from the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine. Uh, and um, consultant what, what, no, sorry, what was his, what did he bring to the table? He, he was the individual who had the substantial public sector ICT experience. Is this the digital switch over you're talking about? No, that was Consultant A. Right. So Consultant B was the Department of Agriculture. So a retire, retired uh, official at Assistant Secretary level from the Department of Agriculture who would have operated for the bulk of his career in the IT sector. Was there anything particular in the IT sector that he was experienced at? It was just general IT? It, it was, it was, he would have been responsible for the IT uh, network and systems in the Department of Agriculture, which is, as you know, a very big operation. Just on that point. So this individual was responsible for the IT sector within the Department of Agriculture. No specific expertise in relation to in co uh, data, you know, specific coding in relation to postcodes or anything like that. He came from the Department of Agriculture, no connection to your department. So obviously, that was a skill set that was available. If you went down to Sir John Rogerson's Key, you would probably find thousands of people with that skill set, and yet you still didn't advertise it. No, I don't accept that back for a second. In a minute, I uh, want to, on, on, to clarify this. Yeah. Consultant C, then. Consultant C uh, was em employed as the process auditor on the procurement process. For where? I beg your pardon? This He's is a retired civil servant. Yeah, from where? Uh, to the best of my knowledge, he was uh, a senior level uh, official in the Department of Jobs, Enterprise and Innovation. And what was his particular skill set? He Procurement? Would have, he would have, yeah, absolutely, and he would have done similar uh, process audit for work for a range of government departments, as I understand it. Uh, a, B, C, D then? Consultant D are a They're pri outside. private sector company. Uh, and they would have provided uh, expertise in relation to the development of a privacy impact assessment, which was a requirement of the Data Protection Commissioner. Yeah. E then was the legal. D e was the legal. Outside. Yeah. And that was it. And that was F. F, F was seconded in from RV as a project prog uh, or program manager. So, very expert project management skills. So, there's a break. Can I go back to air code? Um, what, what's the usage now of the air codes? Are the, uh, are the codes used extensively by departments, by on post? Uh, for example, in their general circulation of material by on post, do they use air codes? So we have seen uh, we have seen a significant increase in activity over specifically, Mr. Griffin. For example, with Unpost, do they use it? Do, do Unpost use it? Uh, they, they, do they use it in relation to mail's delivery? For they example, they sent out their circulars at Christmas, yeah. their Christmas cards. Do they use it then? They use it as part of their sortation system. So they use it on their addresses. That may well be the case. Yeah. Uh, uh, do the government departments use it? Yes, they do. All of them? Uh, all of the ones that have been encoded are starting to... Uh, so they don't all use it at present? All the ones that, are, that have been encoded are starting to use it. I mean, let me just give you a run through some of the key ones. Uh, just, just give me that name, because I, I don't want to spend too long. Social revenue... HSE starting to use it. I thought it. Revenue didn't use it. Yeah, Revenue do use it. I mean... Uh, since when? They've started using it since about last October. Uh, it has gone out on about 800,000 pieces of correspondence from the Revenue Commissioners. 
Uh, DSP will issue about 400,000 pieces of air code enabled correspondence per month. ESB uh, Electric Ireland will start issuing ESB bills from next Monday. I think about 20,000 20, bills as part of their 650,000 uh, billing cycle. Commercial operators then, we we'll go back to say the freight companies, parcel service, I saw two different companies mentioned there, but in a lot of the freight companies when they use it, um, they abandon it uh, because they say it's not accurate. I wouldn't accept that for a second. So I don't know who I don't know who is has said that to you, Deputy, in relation to the lack of accuracy. But uh, I don't know whether you heard uh, Sean O'Rourke uh, the other morning, uh, where there was an individual called Gareth Daly, I think it was, who is a film producer and media media production company in the Midlands, who has had ongoing problems in contracts, scripts and so on uh, getting uh, mislaid, not arriving to him and he said just before Christmas he said I'll give this air code a shot. He hasn't had a problem since. And the guy said, he said to the guy, how did you find me? He said, air code you just stick, put it into the air code finder and we get it there. Uh, who, I, who engages with the different companies, be the, uh, the commercial operators and uh, government agencies to determine you know, do you use it? How far in the con how far have you gone in the concept of development your systems yeah. to enable you to use it? Who measures that? Is that so, your department, or is it? Yeah. So, so, so Capita, Capita, who are the uh, postcode management license holder, engage with the commercial companies both in terms of selling the product and and supporting them in terms of the rollout. So as far as you're concerned, there is a rollout going on. It is ongoing. It is successful. Uh, it will take time. What right? kind of time? Well, do you think? Well, I would expect to see a big increase in the level of visibility during the course of the year. Um, like motor tax online, uh, I think from the 18th of January, um, has been upgraded to include include air codes. Okay. Um, the register of electors, you'd be delighted to hear, has been upgraded to include uh, include uh, include air codes. Why does it have to be so complicated, the actual code itself, the in terms code of itself. memory of the code of your location? So you, you have a code for each of the individual 2.2 million addresses in the state. I mean, one of the criticisms, first of all, was, well, do you need a unique code or do you need the sort of the group code that they have in the UK? It would have been useless in terms of our own system when you have 35% non-unique non addresses. I think it, when I say 35% non-unique addresses, I mean, people kind of assume, well, okay, that's a bit of an issue. The nearest to us in the OECD in terms of the number of non-unique addresses are Portugal, and that's 2%. So we have a fundamentally different, uh, a fundamentally different type of problem in the state. So the, the code is unique. Uh, it um, first three, the first three digits are the uh, root and key, and the other four digits then are to uh, identify the individual property. I, I'm, not, I'm not sure that it's all that complicated. Uh, there was an issue raised by the, the freight associations, for example, as to why they couldn't be sequential. Yeah. Well, the reason why they can't be se sequential is if you look, for example, at our, our housing policy, the intention is that we're going to use, like, utilize to the greatest extent possible brownfield and infill sites. You build a house, two houses, or a block of apartments on an infill site in any town or city across the state, you have to resequence all the other postcodes on the far side of it. So, I mean, we're. Do you get sort of 214 A, B, C, D, or what do you get? Well, you know, well when, the, when way, the way it is designed, uh, if you build in an infill site, it is, it is the routing key stays the same, the other four uh, elements will change and won't necessarily be aligned in any way with what the existing. identifier then for the new infill in So the new infill site, I mean, if it's a house, it'll be, it'll be uh, A65, ABCD. If it's a block of apartments for each apartment in the, in the apartment block, it will each have its own unique air code. Again, they will not be sequenced. That's why they're not sequential. Yeah. And to go back to the actual cost then of all of this, and dealt with by Deputy O'Donovan, okay, we've learned our lessons from it. Um, 
just cover the final cost for me again and, and, and uh, tell me if there's no, is there any further costs to be incurred from this? So the overall cost, uh, as pointed out in the CNAG report, when you factor in when you factor in VAT and when you factor in the department's staffing costs, um, is 38 million. We spent 21.85 million. Uh, there's a balance then of 14 and a half million uh, that could accrue over the period of the licence and that is on the basis of certain KPIs uh, being achieved and there are service level agreements in place um, which set out uh, the, the key performance indicators to be achieved and payments would be based on that. There are, there are no additional costs over and above the 38 million from the department's perspective. And in the context of the design and the licensing and the incentives and so on for the use of it, uh, built into the arrangement, um, is, is, is there a built-in mechanism to allow for the improvements? So it throws up a problem here and there. Does that problem get resolved without cost to you? Um, As you roll out a system, yeah. you're, you're going to find issues with it. I presume that that won't come back to the no. department, that no. that's a matter no. and in fact, that uh, capita will start out. Yeah. And in fact, so much effort has gone into development of the design of the postcode that I believe that the postcode itself is an enduring, uh, is an enduring piece of infrastructure which will not require... Uh, amendment. There are ongoing, there are issues that Capita obviously have to engage in in terms of it commercialising the product. Uh, what it does in relation to that is entirely a matter between uh, between Capita uh, and the entity that it is dealing with within the the, the overall cost figures that I've outlined to you. Um, so I don't see any additional unforeseen costs arising for the arising for the department. Okay. Um, I just want to ask you a question in relation to another part of your department. Inland Fisheries, that's yours, isn't it? It is. Um, just general questions. Um, there's a list of assets there, and I'm just wondering... Um, I saw one here where... Inland fisheries to have accommodation. Yes. 2012, it was 107,976, and in 2013, it was 110,489. What is it? You're reading from the accounts. Okay. Yeah. Page 15 of the accounts. Page 15 of the appropriation account. No, I think it's the IFI account, is it? Yeah, IFI, yeah. It's IFI. IFI. Do you deal specifically with these, no? I think you had intended... Oh, you just give them the money, is that it? We just give them the money, and we try to control it as well. Uh, I think you had intended to have the IFI in before... Yeah, the no, we had, yeah, and I yeah. just... Going down so the, through the, 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 IFI would have, the IFI would have a series of property assets. I mean, they would have had sites out in Swords... Uh, they, I mean, in terms of their, their, their HQ, they would have had a HQ plus uh, premises uh, and warehouses. This, this is a guest house in Connemara. And I was just wondering, when I saw this, who manages that guest house? What is it for? Do staff use it or board members or what is it for? I have no idea, but I'll find out for you. Will you get us a, a note on that? Yeah. Um, and there was a bad debt provision. I'm asking this because, obviously, we, due to, I think it was due to some um, issue or other that we, we had to cancel this particular meeting. Um, but there was a bad debt provision in their accounts in 2013 of 23,660. But in 2012, it was 246,094. You might get us a note on, on that as well. Absolutely. Um, 
And uh, you might give us a note on the board and its members. I have all those places um, yeah. been filled. Um, and because of the fact that you don't deal well, I, think I suppose in detail there, with the accounts I won't pursue yeah, There are two vacancies from memory on the board of IFI at the moment and they're being filled through the public appointment service process. Before next Tuesday? Probably not before not next Tuesday. Be <laughs> would have been a hurry with it. Um, no, just those two, two figures uh, stood out by mine and because of the fact that you don't deal directly uh, with this. But do they then just give you their accounts? So the annual report, and, and you go through them? Yeah, the annual report and accounts are audited by the CNAG. Yeah. They come to the department, we will go through them, and they are submitted to government and laid before both houses of the office. All right. Uh, tribunals, then, in your own department? What are the tribunals there? Well, the only tribunal that uh, we have any residual involvement on is the... Uh, some payments in relation to the Moriarty. Yeah. What are the payments to date on that? Payment to date from to date from our department's vote uh, is is two million. Two million going back from 2004 to 2014. Now, obviously, there there are other substantial costs that are born born on other votes. And what do you expect that figure to be on your side? Well, I, 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 I think it's 2.047 million now. That's it, yeah. I imagine that we're, we're, we're nearing the end of the payment of funds to, uh, to the, um, the uh, workings of the tribunal. We had a figure, um, provisional expenditure for 2015, of about 24,000. So you can see sub substantial reductions in the payments over the last number of years. Uh, and one would hope that we're nearing the end of having to, to uh, provide funds for that. Other departments then would have cost, did you say? Teachers. 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 Yeah. 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 Teachers. That's the carrier of the big one. Um, is there any one single department in either yours or Thetix that has a kind of a, a rolling cost that keeps it all together? Thetix would probably, probably okay. have, but I mean, as you can see, we're, we're, we're a fraction of the overall cost. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I What's think, the overall cost? Uh, uh, well, I think the, um, the vote for uh, Thetix is just showing the expenses that their vote has, has borne. I think you'd have to, uh, or uh, it would require an exercise to accumulate these expenses from the other um, the other votes that would be you expected. have no idea, Mr. Carthen, not uh, not offhand, but I, I I would imagine that apart from Taoiseach's, um that the greatest expense would have been in relation to your own department, uh, to, to this department. So whatever the figure is in Taoiseach's, it's plus less, this, uh, I mean it's, it, that's a very substantial figure. Yeah. And um, obviously there would be um, outstanding um, uh, claims uh, to the Moriarty Tribunal, which we do. I think they have a provisional estimate in as to the amount there, but I, I, offhand I can't, can't say about how, that. How can the Public Accounts Committee get that overall figure? You, you ask the two different departments, and so that yours is 2.047 plus 23, yeah. uh, or sorry, 24,736, and then coupled with that then you'd have the figure from the Thetix department. Yes. Um, and you don't expect to pay too much more. Would the Taoiseach's department expect to pay more? Well, they, there would be uh, claims for expenses, legal uh, costs from, from witnesses. And they will come in? Uh, they pro will take some time to, to come through. Oh, I see. But uh, there is a contingent uh, liability figure, I think, in uh, Taoiseach's vote in relation to that. Okay. If we could check it, maybe, yeah, with yeah, the yeah, 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 um, television uh, licences, they were down, were they? It was lower than expected. They were lower than expected, yeah. Why is that? Not four. So, no.
Right, well, let me definitely, I, I just want to, I mean, the sales were down, but I just want to give you the, the numbers, uh, the, the reduction during 2014. Broadcasting it went from 216,000 down to 213, and your estimate was 217. Yeah. So it's down 3 million yeah. ish. So we make a best shot at the start of the year. I mean, this is, you know, money we get is by way of appropriations and aid, and that's why you see savings during the course of the year, because all we have at that stage is our best estimate in relation to um, the likely level of um, uh, licenses to be, to be procured in the coming year. I do have better figures than this in the briefing that I have, Deputy, but um, what I'll do is what I'll do is, is get you a better note on that. I yeah. mean, if you look at um, funding receipts in 2014, you're talking about an overall receipt of $213 million. Uh, we had a slight bump in 2015, and that was $214 million. So there has been some pickup during the course of 2015, but I suppose the point I would make on that, that's more a policy point than a numbers point. Uh, we still have an ongoing issue in relation to the level of evasion uh, with TV license. We have about 15 percent evasion levels um, costing the the uh, the system about 25 million between 25 and 27 million per annum. So this is TV license evasion. Oh yeah. So I mean, while we've had a reduction, and that's costing 25 million. 20, about 25 million per year, about 15 percent uh, evasion. So uh, it's an issue that has to be dealt with, and uh, it's something. So there's that a loss of income to the state of 25 million. Some substantial loss of income, yeah. Uh, that could be used by. Um, RTE, TG Car, um, the local the radio stations, the local radio so stations, uh, the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, the sound and visual schemes that are used. So it, it is an issue that is there and absolutely need, need, needs to be tackled, and it needs to be tackled in the context of the um, the change in approach to how people consume media. And you'll recall that you know we had intended at a point in time to introduce the public service broadcasting uh, charge, but obviously that's something that will fall to a new administration to consider at this point. Just to go back to that Moriarty, if you want to see, December 2014, the accumulated cost in the Taoiseach's department was 50.8 million. So presumably they had costs in 2015 as well. Where they have? So I don't yeah, know yeah. what the figure will be, though. Yeah. Um, just last question then. In terms of legal costs, page 22, section 2, for the settlement of 69,000. Okay, this relates to claims from two former members of the Department of Post and Telegraphs for delays in payment of preserved pension delays in payment of preserved pensions. I mean 
that you delayed paying them their pension and they took uh, or was that their pension? I'm having a note rapidly scribbled for me, so okay. if you give me about 30 seconds. It's just clear enough to come up. And if I can read it. You can write come in, Ms. Cronin, if you want to, and just to, go rather on. than scribbling away there. Go on. You won't be able to read it. <laughs> go on. You press the button, you tell us. This is your moment. <laughs> Here do, you want, do you want a moment? Effectively, uh, there would have been two former members of the Department of Post and Telegraphs, and the Department has continued responsibility for pension payments. And it, in respect to those people, they, they weren't originally entitled to pension payments, but the law changed, and they subsequently um, became entitled to pension payments. After that, though, there was a disagreement between them and the department um, in respect of the, the amount of the pension payments. They took legal cases against us, and as I recall, we made settlement without going to court. But that's, right. that, that's what the well, two settlements were. There very would have been people who worked a very long time ago for the yeah. Department of Post and Telegraphs, and, and, and there were two legal cases that we settled yeah. in respect to payments. Thanks.